Hello, everyone who's here. Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone who's on the internet. Uh, and uh, I'm sure more people will be coming from both directions. This um, is an event that is uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Bard Canal, which is a nonprofit volunteer group whose mission is um, to uh, protect, conserve, and um, restore, remediate the um, the Pine Street Barge Canal, which is just down the street. In fact, we are part of this land is part of the super the, the super fun site that the Pine Street Barge Canal is also part of. Um, my name is Andy Simon. Andy, can you move a little bit to your? Yep. My name is Andy <laughs> Simon, and um, uh, we part of our uh, work. Uh, at the Barge Canal is cleaning up the garbage that's been there for decades. Part of it is um, really getting people to learn about the Barge Canal because so many people um, have spent their whole life in Burlington and never set foot on the Barge Canal. They've gone by on the bike path, they've gone by on Pine Street, but everybody tells me I've never been there. So uh, we've been trying to do events that uh, also help beautify and clean up and restore uh, the Pine Street Barge Canal, this wild space in the south end of Burlington. But at the same time, our other goal is to bring people to the Barge Canal, give people an opportunity to get to know the that land, beautiful land, better. Um, one of the ways we're doing that is by inviting Dr. Graham Bradley today to talk about uh, what's beneath the Barge Canal, uh, specifically the geology and hydrogeology of, uh, of this interesting area. Um, I, I got to know uh, Graham uh, through his work as a regulator for the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, during a public hearing last October in this very room, I noticed that Besides being a regulator uh, and being a hydrogeologist, Graham was a teacher. And uh, so I asked him to um, exercise that part of his uh, expertise and come and do this talk for us. And I'm very glad you accepted it. Maybe, maybe sorry, I just want to do a quick acknowledgement that, of this land, that the land that we are on is um, unseated. Abnaki land and the Abnaki have, have cared for this land for 10,000 years and are still present on the land. And it's good for us to remember that we are there on the land that was never ceded to us. So that's important. Thank you. Graham, go Thanks, ahead. Ruby. And you see where you've got to stand so we can see the online people can see it. So which of the on the online people are looking at this one? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I need to look that way. Or okay. you want to say you need to stand on the sun or somewhere instead of over there. Yes. Yeah. Um, we'll be putting the slides on soon and I'll probably disappear. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Andy. I am um, uh, really grateful for Friends of Art Canal for inviting me along today. It's given me an opportunity to look a little closely, more closely at uh, the geological history of this site. Um, it was difficult to know where to, where to pitch my talk, so I will try and gauge that as we go along. Um, I may have one or two too many slides, so I may end up skipping one or two. I'll keep an eye on the clock, and uh, I think we have about an hour and a half in this room. Um, hopefully, I can keep it well under an hour in the time for questions. If, I, uh, if I'm saying something that is really someone doesn't understand, I'm happy for people to... Um, it might be a little difficult for people online, but if anyone in the room wants to ask a question as I go along, I'm happy to, uh, to take questions. That actually helps me know how to gauge, um, gauge the talk and where to set it. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you want to bring up the um, first uh, slide. Sure, let's get um, I need to do that. Green share and set up again. Uh, okay. Oops. So um, while you're doing that, 
Um, I'll just tell you a bit about my background. You can tell uh, I've got an English accent. Um, I moved. Uh, um, I moved to Oswego, uh, upstate New York, central New York, to work at the State University of New York there, uh, 2012, uh, working in the Department of Geology. I was there for about five years, six years, and um, we fell in love with Vermont. I liked it, the long trail, spending all our time over here. So in the end, I ended up moving over here and got a job with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, prior to um, working at SUNY Oswego, I worked for 17 years with a consulting company, um, groundwater specialist, hydrogeology, working in the UK, but also in Vancouver and Canada as well. And then I have what I call my, my midlife crisis and went off and did a PhD halfway through my career, <laughs> uh, which was actually in Uganda, uh, looking at the evolution of the landscape in Uganda and the influence of that on groundwater resources, um, groundwater resources in Uganda. Okay, and that brings us to the first slide. So um, I am the site manager uh, on behalf of the state. Um, we oversee what EPA do, make sure the state agrees with it on Superfund sites. And I'm also the, the Brownfields manager for 453 Pine, Pine Street as well. But I'm taking off my regulator hat tonight, okay? So I won't be answering any specific regulation questions. I'm a geologist tonight and a, and a groundwater specialist. Uh, and Andy asked me to talk about the, the hydrogeology because he knows that's what I'm involved with professionally. Actually, the main focus of my talk is on the, the geological history tonight. Um, but I've tried to add in some hydrogeology to understand the groundwater flow, the hydrogeology, you have to understand the, the geology as well. And I will say that, you know, I haven't done the investigations at this site. I haven't done the research at this site. I am presenting work done by many, many other people. Um, Don Maynard, um, he was involved with the Johnson Company in the original site investigations at the Superfund site. And I'm using some of his images. Uh, I'm friends with Stephen Wright and George Springston, two well-known local um, geologists that work on the, uh, the glacial deposits and the river deposits in Vermont. Um, Ugo, my colleague, um, um, some of you may know he did a lot of work on maps in, in Burlington and, dis and discovered, rediscovered this, this ravine that goes through the middle of, um, of uh, Burlington as well. By the way, I live in Plainfield, so I'm not totally familiar with all of the streets so, and, and, and the vicinity. So Vermont Geological Survey, my colleagues there, and then some of the consultants that have worked on the site, Stone Environmental, Weston and Samson, I've already mentioned, Johnson Company, which um, uh, have now involved it, uh, taken over by VHP, worked there, uh, uh, VHP, EPA, DEC, and the thousands of other researchers that universities and PhD students, et cetera, that have piece together the uh, geology of Vermont over time. Yeah, is this going to work? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? Do, do, do that. Make it go to the next slide. Just okay. work this way. Okay. Sorry, my mouth is a bit dry. I'm going to talk in a while. Um, some slides I'm going to go through fairly quickly. This is just, we're going to come back to this. This is just um, an indication of how we know about the geology under our feet at um, Pine Street Barge Canal. This is actually um, sort of a section for those uh, at home. I'm pointing at the screen um, on the uh, right hand side there. And, I, and I'm hoping to explain that as we go along. Each of those colored vertical lines there is a borehole that's being put down through the different geological layers using a drilling rig like this. And all of those uh, young site geologists on site logging the, uh, the soils that were brought up and they're able to unlock the characteristics of those 
to help us understand how the groundwater flows and um, understand how they, were, where they, how they were formed, what environment they were formed in, because we can use that to piece together the, the different layers, correlate the difference between boreholes and understand the geological history of the site. And I'm, I'm focusing on that geological history tonight. There we go. Okay, so this is a, a diagram taken from a 1999 report by Don Maynard, and I'm kind of using this as the basis of my talk. I'm not expecting you to understand this slide now, but hopefully by the end of tonight, you will have a better understanding of it. This are all the different layers, one on top of another, going back down to the bedrock, uh, these are just approximate depths to give you an idea of the scale that we're talking about at 140 feet. It varies across the site, bedrock, and then we've got other layers at 60 feet, 20, 10, and then we've got the ground surface up there. Um, and um, we're going to go through it, starting at the bottom, the rock, 500 million years old. And that won't be the, necessarily the focus of this talk, but I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about that, the bedrock right at the bottom of the pile, and we'll co be coming up through the pile to sediments deposited in a glacial lake um, during the last glaciation, the last ice age, um, around uh, 13 to 12,000 years ago. Then we'll have kind of a, it's a bit of a spoiler here for those of you who don't know, it's kind of an exciting part of the talk. We've actually got uh, marine deposits under there, uh, about 12 to 10,000 years old. And that fits in nicely with what you were saying about the uh, first peoples here. And um, it's not my speciality, but I understand uh, that there's evidence of the first peoples as the ice sheets receded um, around that. that. Um, shoreline, uh, Lake Champlain. I know we've got archaeologists in the room, so uh, call out if I'm <laughs> getting that wrong. Now we start to get some to something that's uh, a little bit more familiar. So this is um, post ice age. I think I put five thousand less than five thousand. It might be only a thousand, but uh, <laughs> to a geologist, that's uh, that's a uh, um, think of the fingers, um, a thousand years. So we're getting much more recent, and you might be able to sort of start to pick out um, some of the features that you, know, you can kind of vaguely make out on the maps around the Pipe, Pipe Street Barge Canal. And then we get um, up to the last 200 years um, when we've got uh, um, Burlington growing and um, the Barge Canal, the lagoon being infilled and the industrial development on site. So that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, and as I said, hopefully by the end of the talk, um, you'll understand a bit, a bit more about that so geological succession. So I'm going to start with the bedrock. And uh, I, I uh, yeah, it's been obvious. I'm trying to uh, like use to the computer and your slides if you just want to say next or something. Okay, uh, well, it's a little awkward because I've got some animations and things. Uh, what I might do is just put it on the chair here, if that's going to work. Let's see if that works. Oh, we're going on to the next one. These are some of the slides I'm, oh, I might end up missing. How do I go backwards? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Come out and go back in. Back around. Um, back around. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I read that in previous. There we go. Okay. So that geological succession I had, I'm right down at the bottom of it. The bedrock, 140 feet down, 100 to 140 feet down. Beneath where you're standing, if you've stood in the woods there on the trail at the, uh, at the canal. And what we've got there is a rock called the Moncton Quartzite, predominantly made of quartz. And it's the same rocks as at uh, Red Rocks Park. 
I haven't been there. I, I really want to go. I have to go there. And given the fossils that are in that rock, we know it's kind of 500 million years old during what geologists call the Cambrian period, which was when there was the explosion of complex multicellular life. Um, so some of the oldest sort of complex organisms on Earth there at this age, 500 million years old. Um, and there's other features in these rocks, um, ripple marks, you can see these, these are sediment, sedimentary rocks deposited by water. Um, and the trilobite fossils, worm burrows, raindrop imprints. So do you think this was deep water or shallow water? It's got raindrops. Shallow, yeah. So uh, deposited in, in relatively shallow water. Let's see if we can get this working now. Now, this is the this is the slide that I wondered whether I should even um, bother with this. Yes, uh, I'm going to go through 500 million years in a couple of minutes. <laughs> here's here's your uh, 200 million years ago to 500 million years ago. Here's your uh, mountain formation. These are all the names that geologists give these different periods. Above this is the Jurassic. So everyone's over the Jurassic, the Jurassic Park. And uh, the Moncton Formation here, it's on the edge of this, this continent down here. And all I really want to get out of this, what I want to explain is why we have glacial sediments sat straight on top of the bedrock. What's happened in between? These are, these are less than 20,000 years old. These are 500 million years old. Where's the missing history? 500 million years missing. Well, what happened during that time, there was three different collisions, global collisions, mountain building events against the, uh, the original uh, continents here. I don't have time to do the plate tectonics. You know, uh, I, I can talk more afterwards if you like. So we had a, um, a volcanic island arc similar to Japan and crashing into Laurentia. When I say crashing at the speed of your, the, the, your fingernails grow. <laughs> okay. um, then we had this uh, microcontinent also came piling into, the, into uh, Laurentia. This microcontinent, geologists give it the name um, Avalonia. Avalon. What do you associate with Avalon? King Arthur. Jersey Shore. Jersey Shore. Uh, that's a new one on me. <laughs> Avalon is an old, old, old name for England. And actually, England was, is at the northern part of that microcontinent. So at this point, my country was crashed and was part of. Uh, Part of North America. I'm going to go quick. Finally, um, Africa crashed into North America or Baltica, as we call, as geologists call it that. And so we have this huge area here through the uh, Green Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains, where we have we've had several collisions against the edge of North America. So we have these huge mountains here, the size of the Himalayas. And over time, we're still only at uh, 300 million years old here. We've got another 300 million years. And over that time, they have eroded down. And uh, so those have eroded down. And then to east, the, east, the uh, Atlantic Ocean opened up. So this is why we have, this is where this missing piece went. We've got 500 million years missing here, and it's essentially, it's because these old mountains are uh, eroded down, creating what geologists call an unconformity. The only thing I want you to get out of here is this is the geology of the Mon, and, and overall, those bedrock layers are all north-south, and that's because we've got these three different collisions into this, this ancient continent. And we're up here in Burlington, and we're on these, these sediments here that were originally deposited on the edge of, of Laurentia. So that's, that's the bedrock geology, very quickly. 
it's not really what I want to focus on today, but I thought it was good to uh, point out why we've, why, what's happened to that missing pin screen. Um, and then we've got glacial sediments deposited, deposited by a glacier, sat so right on top there. Deposited during what we call the uh, Wisconsin glaciation. Um, and uh, the height of that ice age was around about, there have been many glaciations over the last, I forget how long, over a million years, the last million years, coming and going. But the most recent one reached its height about 25,000 years ago when an ice sheet covered the whole of Vermont. Now, it didn't quite look like this. I looked for a photo online that might represent an ice sheet, because actually most of the mountains in Vermont, there's no evidence that they poked out. It, it, the ice was a long way above Mount Mansfield and Camel's Hump. It was, it was actually higher than that. So, you know, we're starting to get to a point where basically the bedrock of Vermont is formed and there is a proto sort of Champlain Valley here with a glacier going down it being eroded by the ice. So I can now stand in this room and imagine myself under this ice sheet with several kilometers, several miles of ice on top of me now, um, 20,000 years ago. So this is showing kind of the maximum extent of that ice sheet. And I've uh, picked out the um, uh, outline of, of the Mont there. Okay, so what did that leave us behind? What's under Pine Street? Right at the bottom of the pile here, just on top of the bedrock, are these sands and gravels. And because we know that they're um, smoothed and rounded, they have had some, um, they've been washed um, and rolled around in the meltwater from that glacier. So the ice sheet started to recede. You started to get more and more meltwater and uh, it's carrying the sediment with it that it's eroded in the bedrock. And um, you start to have ice, uh, water on top of the glacier and under the glacier. And then when that melts, it's left that kind of in depressions in the, in the bedrock at the base. The, the debris that was carried by the ice itself, uh, there isn't really any evidence of that, what we call till, there isn't any evidence of that uh, uh, at the bottom of that pile in Pine Street. There's just these, um, what I call glacial fluvial positive by the water and the ice right, right at the bottom. So the, the glacier scoured the rock, left it clean, and then, and then those rivers in the glacier left that sand and gravel behind. So we started building up, so we're starting to build up that, that geological su succession. Okay. And so the ice continues to recede. Here's the outline of the bonk again. We're now at around about 13,000 years ago. And uh, we start to get uh, lakes developing. They're dammed by the, by the ice. There's meltwater coming off the ice and there's lakes forming in, in front of the ice there. It's not quite right. This is showing the outlines of the modern lakes. Actually, the, the lake um, in the area of Lake Ontario, Lake... Uh, um, Iroquois, um, the geologists have named it, um, was actually bigger than that. You can imagine um, a lot more water coming down. It's dammed by the ice. It's a lot bigger. But we do have this lake here in the Champlain Valley, or what will become the Champlain Valley. And it's not yet Lake Champlain. Call it Lake Vermont. Um, it is dammed by the ice sheet. Okay, the water's starting to melt, it's starting to come off the ice, and it's uh, creating a lake. There's actually other lakes. There's a lake in the Connecticut Valley called Lake Hitchcock as well. 
Okay, so we have Lake Vermont. What has Lake Vermont left us? Oh. Did I skip a slide by accident? Yes, I go to uh, previous. There we go. Just check I've got. Uh, okay, so here um, is that kind of overview of Glacial Lake Vermont. And so it, um, you've got to imagine as the ice is retreating further north, this lake grows in size. And I've actually, uh, we're sat there. So now, again, this is what we do as geologists. This is what turned me on about geology in the first place, that looking at the, the soils and the rock beneath my feet. I, I was, when I was a teenager, I was a big uh, Tolkien fan of Middle Earth. And then I discovered that through geology, I could actually look at the Middle Earth that existed here, where I'm standing now. And that's what I'm thinking about now. I'm, st I'm stood here, and there's hundreds of feet of cold glacial lake above my head, above all of our heads. Mm. Okay, if you were here um, 13,000 years ago, you'd be pretty cold. <laughs> and you'd be pretty deep in water as well. Okay, you can actually look at this for yourself. If you Google um, uh, Natural Resource Atlas, the Vermont Natural Resource Atlas, it will take you to a web page with a online geographical information system, GIS, and there's a load of boxes on the, the left-hand side and you can play around with those layers, turn them on and off, and there's just loads. In, in fascinating information. If you want to look at cities, you can look at the property boundaries, the roads, etc. That turn all those off. Yeah, I can turn on the geology. I can turn on the uh, extent of the glacial lakes as well. So I downloaded this from, from that website, um, Natural Resource Atlas. So what did that leave behind? Oh, and there's an image of uh, what you might see. This is a smaller lake. Lake Vermont, but it's a, it's a glacial lake to get that impression of the ice uh, retreating. Okay, and so now we've added several tens of feet onto that um, uh, <coughs> geological session, succession um, under Pine Street that was all deposited in that glacial lake that was hundreds of feet above our head. And it's deposited. Um, something called, uh, well, different layers, um, varved silts and clays, we call them these fine layers of silts and clays. So what do I mean by varves? And this is one of the pieces of evidence that we know this is glacial lake sediment. What happens is, during the summer, the temperature warms up, the glacier starts melting. Some of that sediment, that sand, is washed off into the lake in front of the glacier. And that sand, it's, it's, it's a larger particle, it's heavy, it falls to the bottom, creating those tens of feet of lake sediments. But during the winter, what happens during the winter in lake? What happens to Lake Champlain? <laughs> yeah, it's freezing. <laughs> Same happens to that lake in front of the ice sheet. That gives a chance, and then it's, it's very quiet and really nice. And that gives a chance for the finer layers, salts and clays, to fall to the bottom. And this happens year after year after year. For how, how long did I say the lake existed? Yeah, a thousand years, a thousand years. And um, uh, it builds up over time. And so this is an actual uh, photograph. I forget which it, lake it's taken from. Uh, my presentation, I do have, uh, I, I, I haven't uh, quoted names. I've tried to reference the, the pages where I've got these, these images from. This is from a different lake, a different uh, uh, part of Vermont where we still see these, these varved plays, uh, alternating fine, and coarse sediment. So we don't see that throughout the, 
the cause in um, under Pine Street, but I understand it. They have seen it in some locations. And that's evidence that it was uh, that seasonal deposition in a, in a glacial lake. Any questions? So, Graham, some of the borings that have been done at Pine Street would might look like that. Um, I've done, they're probably not quite as nice <laughs> as a good example as VARVs as that, but I understand that they have seen um, VARVs. Um, they were actually able to use this for dating, um, looking very detailed and counting the, counting back the VARVs as well. You know, that's used in our, yeah. well, geology, geology. Okay. What happens next? Yeah, yeah. So about uh, it might have been a little later, earlier than that, about a 12, 11 and a half thousand years ago, the ice sheet has made its way back into what we now know as uh, Quebec. And the, this ice sheet was so heavy that it actually um, uh, pushed the crust of the earth down a little. So under that ice, the, the, the ground was actually lower than it is today. So when this ice sheet started to um, recede, it was able to, uh, it, it led in the ocean. Okay, in the St. Lawrence Valley, um, Gulf of St. Lawrence, the ocean was able to come in and it actually came in all the way up into the Champlain Valley. Um, and uh, those in the room who are more familiar with the indigenous history, the first peoples of this area, I understand there's evidence around 11,000 years um, um, associated with the shoreline. Of, of this um, ancient. And so that, that times, that's very nice because it kind of, you know, at the same time, uh, uh, humans, people were uh, uh, moving northwards in Europe. They were also moving northwards in North America as the ice receded and making use of that, that land that was opening up after the ice sheet receded around Lake Champlain there. Okay. Let me just, uh, so now we've added. Another sequence to our uh, cause on the Pine Street. So now yeah, one, of, one of my objectives uh, this evening is just, uh, you know, try and give you a glimpse of, of, uh, of how a geologist looks at the world. When, when I will go out to, to you know, I, I walked past tonight before I came here and I was looking at, at the trees and the current environment, and on a beautiful day like today, it was it was, uh, it was lovely to see. Um, but as a geologist, I'm also looking at other features in the landscape that point to this hidden history um, below our feet as well at the, at, the, at the canal. So you can see here, it came all the way into, uh, into Quebec. I've actually, uh, my first job uh, five years ago, a bit of a contrast to uh, uh, being a professor, I was working in the Leach Field program, uh, looking for uh, teaching uh, soil descriptions to Leach Field designers and engineers. And I was working up in South Hero, where they were digging holes to see if it was suitable soils for, um, for a Leach Field, for a septic system. And Seashells, clear as day, um, bivalves, mollusks, um, layers and layers of them in here. That is from the Champlain Sea. That's the evidence we have for that Champlain Sea. Does anyone else? No one else was found. Evidence of a the Charlotte whale. <laughs> the Charlotte whale. Oh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. I'm glad I'm. Uh, uh, I'm glad others are aware of this as well. Uh, and again, you're probably uh, know, have known about this for a lot longer than I have. Um, when I, I Googled this, I didn't realize it was found in, in Charlotte. This is, the, this is the whale, it's a beluga. 
I've tried to keep put a photo on this present a photo for each of these environments and what, what it would look like today. So you can imagine yourself in a boat back there on the Champlain Sea uh, in, in this area that became Vermont, um, watching the belugas <laughs> in the sea like that. Perhaps with uh, camels something in the back. Was the sea salty? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's salt water. Yeah. Um, the whale, interestingly, and this will come back to our story a little later. They found it while constructing the railroad between Rutland and Burlington in 1849. I think it was about ten feet down. Okay, so very um, obvious evidence. Uh, you know, belugas don't live in freshwater. But you can probably, if you go digging in the right place, you may not be lucky enough to find a, a whale skeleton, but uh, there's a number of places where it's pretty easy to find those seashells. So, I wonder if they knew what they found. Um, I don't have to be in the rail, the railroad workers did, but, <laughs> but um, uh, there's articles online, I didn't take time to. It's now, uh, I believe it's um, yeah. in the museum at UVA. Yeah. 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 I'm excited, I wanna go and see that, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Has anyone seen? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, right, so again, this is taken from the Natural Resource Atlas. Um, it's still got the lake on, um, but what they've done to so, show the sea, Champlain Sea, so so this the unhatched area is actually dry dry land by the time it's invaded by the sea. Um, we're here again, Pine Street Canal in, inside that yellow circle. It's a little small to see, but there's actually a an, a, an island, an unhatched area. And that that was an island up just east of us. And uh, you might be able to see that on some maps. I'll show it in a moment. I'm not quite sure of the name of the streets. Um, so the, the sea level's a little shallower, 100 feet or something above our heads right now. So uh, after, the, uh, after the ice receded, but we're now uh, under underwater and there's whales swimming around. <laughs> Middle Earth. <laughs> okay, so this is where I try to get out. I have to remember, I'm not, uh, I'm not giving a talk to, uh, to my university students, but I think it's, it's, it's good to try and understand what, why, why is it freshwater now? Why is it a lake now? Why isn't it still the sea? Remember I said that the ice sheet pushed the land down, the weight of the ice pushes the earth's crust down. Well, after the ice is all gone, or it's retreated back, that weight's gone, and the, and the land bounces back. So now Quebec comes up, and and that and uh, and the um, Champlain Sea recedes. The coastline recedes back to its current day position, leaving Lake Champlain and the Champlain Valley high and dry. Now you've still got all those rivers and things flowing into it, so eventually it becomes fresh water. We're left with the, the lake we have today. Initially, it was a little, um, let me see. Uh, the level of the lake is partly determined by that, that rebound there, that's stopping it flowing out that way. At one point, it was actually quite uh, higher than it is today. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you that, that old shoreline. So what was the edge of the Champlain Sea was once horizontal, of course, um, lakes and oceans are flat, <laughs> um, water finds its level, but when we look for evidence of where the edge of that sea was, now it's sloping, and that's our evidence that the, the land to the north has bounced back, it's, it's lifted up. Does that make sense? Good. Good. Okay, um, I originally had this later in the talk, I thought it was good to put it in here, and it just reminds us where we are. 
So we have a modern day map, Arch Canal here, super fun site in, in this area, 453 Pine Street in here. Moving back, here's Pine Street itself. You, you're probably more familiar with the streets um, than I am. What is, uh, what is this area? What are the, is this a school, a playing it's field? UVM. Is it UVM playing fields? What's there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, UVM playing fields up on the hill there, you know, I mentioned there was an island in the Champlain Sea. They were on that island. Okay. If you were back there 11,000 years ago, you'd have had to get a boat out. To them. And when we look at the geology there, that's where we get, we do get some glacial sediments, but we also get some beach sediments from the edge of the, the Champlain Sea there. Here we have our marine clays here that we deposited in that. Uh, um, Lake Vermont, Lake Champlain is a lot lower than um, the Champlain Sea. We're still not at the current shoreline. This is still um, higher than the current shoreline. And I just took a, a walk along. Um, so if I stand in front of uh, the Barge Canal, 453, and peer through the buildings, there's a steep slope along behind these buildings here. Do you know where I'm, I'm talking about? Yeah. And, and that was uh, an old shoreline there, back there. So they, they, and they, these are the actual uh, you know, geological layers. So initially, the edge of Champlain, Lake Champlain, was, was the other side of um, Pine Street. There was an old shoreline here, and you can see that in the uh, topography as well. So what we're going to move on to do is, so we're, <laughs> I got a bit enthusiastic with the slides. I hope everybody's, uh, okay. We're going to get on to some of the things that we're more familiar with in terms of the recent sediments. Um, and they've been looked at in a lot more detail. Um, they influence the hydrogeology, the groundwater the flow, beneath the current site a lot more. Those were actually deposited in a lagoon um, beside Lake Champlain when it, when it was at a lower level um, down there. Okay, so that's moving from Lake uh, Champlain Sea to Lake Champlain. So what was the shoreline like? The original shoreline before the 1800s, before the industrial development. Rhetorical question. How do we know what that shoreline was like, the original shoreline? Well, when I look up, um, again, using the Natural Resource Atlas, all of the natural soil maps are on there. Fortunately, at this zoomed out scale, it doesn't tell you what the different soil types are. If I zoomed in, it, I could click on these and it would tell me what all the different soil types are. But in looking at this, I noticed all of this area, which I've highlighted in orange, is human-made soil. It's built. All of that. And um, uh, you can see the shading under fill here. That's actually uh, the current wetlands. So this, you can, the, the, you've got this, uh, now looking at the, um, right hand image, I've taken the shape of that film and put it on top of what we call a, a LIDAR image. Um, it's like radar, except it uses um, uh, lasers. <laughs> lasers. Basically it bounces, it can fly over with a plane, you fire lasers at the ground and it can detect how long it takes to get back to the plane, the aeroplane. And from that, it knows how far it's traveled. And so you can build up this uh, uh, release map um, with all the hills and valleys. And so that's what we're showing here. And I would, when I pulled this up and looked at this, one or two people said they'd heard of this ravine. And you can actually still see that on the, on the LIDAR. Um, so if you know where to look, 
when you go towards Main Street, College Street, is it um, know which buildings to look out for? You can see there's a, a depression in the ground and it's been kind of built around. And this was a channel. They, they still exist to this day on the other side, on the Winooski side. So it would have been a feature similar to these other ones on the uh, north side, on the Winooski side. And that channel flowed down into this, this lagoon here, as it originally was, um, into um, Lake Champlain at that time. So I colored it in blue to show the original shoreline. And if you walk along, as I did just before I came today, walk along Pine Street, look to the east, you can see that shoreline. You see that steep slope that goes up. So we're sat in the lagoon right now. Okay, we're going our feet wet. We're in a, we're, uh, at different times during the history of that, uh, we may have been underwater, the sandy, silty bottom, and other times uh, there was a lot of vegetation in there. It's like the moss, and the veg, uh, lagoon vegetation. Um, uh, that's we're sat uh, down here now within that lagoon area. So everything comes together: the uh, the salt maps, the um, the lidar image, show where that old shoreline was. So why did they build that extra land? This is where we get into the history, maybe a little into uh, industrial archaeology. <laughs> it was because of the uh, lumber trade. Um, this uh, photograph I found online, I may be getting ahead of myself here. That, um, of course, if you see those old images of the ones uh, behind the Capitol building, no trees. Trees in Vermont were cut down, people were trying to farm sheep before the trees came back, brought the maples with them, and they have the, <laughs> the landscape we know today. Uh, but also, they were importing uh, lumber from Canada, it was coming down. The big driver from that was the, um, I understand that just, if there's people who know more about this in this room than me, feel free to speak out. Um, was the building of the Champlain Canal to get that um, processed um, timber um, to the south where, where it was needed. And then San Burlington became the third largest lumber processing port in the country, um, coming from Canada, coming from Vermont. Uh, and you know, they don't they're not able to drag it up the hill of the shoreline and process it there, so they filled it in including the area around the Bio Street Canal. Yeah. But we'll come back to that. Let's go back to the lagoon. Maps. So now we're starting to get into human history, or um, uh, how should I put it, you know, recorded history, as opposed to archaeology history. Um, and this is uh, my colleague Hugo that uh, found these maps, we got a map here from 1830. And I was really pleased when I saw this. Is Pine Street on there? And you see it's, it's called something different. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's before the canal. This is not the canal. This is the um, lagoon once it's all started to fill in with natural scent and natural vegetation, uh, wetland, becoming a wetland, more of a wetland area than a deep lagoon in here. 1830, 1849, what happened in 1849? Railroad. Railroad, exactly, and the whale, found the whale in 1849. Another way of getting that lumber out, Lumber industry is expanding more. So by 1872, they filled in this area. Still this wetland area here. And then, oops, what happened there? Just no. <laughs> Still this wetland area to the south, but now you can see they've turned what was a natural wetland area into the canal for the barges to get that uh, lumber in and out. Okay. 
Sorry, I was probably standing in the screen and looking at the screen a lot of time. Every time you give a talk in a new room, you have to figure out where to stand. Okay, so, that, so that's when it went through that transition from a um, natural lagoon to this um, filled area. And you can see this is, um, so I don't believe anyone in Vermont knew about this. Ugo found it in the NOAA coastal um, survey um, of, of Lake Vermont for navigation purposes, but it, it shows the contours. Um, we got Pine Street growing now, heading south. Still a little bit of filling to do here um, to move Pine Street further south. You can see these contours here around the original side of the uh, side of the lagoon. Oh. And if, uh, different ways of showing it. Um, this map is not really to scale, so I could kind of put it on top of the modern blocks here, but I had to stretch it a little bit to uh, to make it fit south there. You can see the you can see the ravine here very clearly on this map. You can see the old lagoon shoreline. You can see where the the open water was at that time before the the canal was built. And what makes it a lagoon? Where does I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, I'll get to that. Good question. Um, and just, I thought people might be interested to see these maps to try and picture, um, compare what it's like now to be before, before all that filling. So I, I put that area, that original coastline um, on, the, on the image there. So you can see where, where that original coastline was. And, and all of that is all of that, um, human-made fill, man-made fill, as we used to say. So that's probably wasn't so in that area there for the lumber industry. We claim for the lumber industry. And here it is on the, uh, the LIDAR image. So that's a kind of fun one to look at because you can see that that old shoreline matches up. I'll walk on there, you can see the shoreline. You can see where it suddenly goes up behind the buildings there. So everything you stood on west of that is uh, is filling. An incredible amount. I, I'm not sure where it came from. Yeah. It's all the mills, right? Doesn't it come from the mills? Well, there's some sawdust, but most of it is silt and clay. It's a good point. Most of it's silt and clay, soil from somewhere. Okay. So we've added. The top bit, the sands in the lagoon and the peat, the organic material. And um, I looked around for what might, uh, are you, uh, oh, where's the arrow? How do I move the arrow? Oh, okay. I looked around for what might be an, an analogous environment today to give you an idea of what it might have looked, a little idea, it's not perfect. A little idea of what it might have looked like today. This is um, on the shoreline of eastern Lake Ontario. We don't really have an analogous environment that I could find, not a very good one. The, the areas that were lagoons, I think, in much Lake Champlain have since naturally filled up. And they're now wetlands beside. So even this has started to fill up. Uh, but there's several examples of the evolution of this on the side of Eastern Lake Ontario when I was in Oswego. SUNY Oswego, we took uh, geophysics equipment, looking at the structure beneath these sandy deposits, this bar here along the edge of these lagoons. So, you know, when we look at the environment around the Pine Street Canal today, beautiful environment, um, but essentially it's a, it's a constructed environment and um, you know, nature is taking over you know, around the canal. Um, but originally it was a different kind of environment on the top there. Um, I can see I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm taking uh, a little long, but we're starting to get there. We're getting near the top of the column. Um, the way it formed, 
geomorphologists talk about something called longshore drift. Basically, we've got sand on the lake shore and the wind and the waves. I'm not going to go into this. The wind and the waves is pushing it down the lake shore. When it gets to a bay, like that area that I'm calling the lagoon, it be, the sand doesn't go into the bay. It begins to cross the bay. keeps moving down and forms this, uh, what we call a spit, sand spit. A barrier spit. You might sometimes call it, if it's underwater at some point, you might call it a barrier bar. My North English, my Northern English accent came out there. <laughs> Certain vowel sounds. So that, this is what we had. We originally had a bay. We had the sand moving down the lake shore. It created a, a bar across the bay here. That's where the railway line is now. They used it. They built on it. The railroad. Um, I keep saying railway, it's my way of saying railroad. <laughs> um, and when it gets blocked off, you're asking about a lagoon. I'm talking about when basically that bar, that spit, uh, crosses the bay or might just leave a, a, a little entrance and that area behind we call the lagoon. Meanwhile, you have the ravine still bringing sediment down the river there. Um, filling it with little deltas and sand on the shoreline in there. So naturally this would fill in. But um, yeah, they uh, decided to help it a lot. Uh, lumber industry. That makes sense? Good. Okay, so just another quick look at that. I've uh, provided the explanation. Um, I don't have an area, I should have an aerial photograph of Pine, Pine Street Canal from the same direction. You can imagine the railway going along this filled in um, the original shoreline, uh, which you can still see. If you see. So we're at the final layer, the, um, the fill, and now some of you may be familiar with this, uh, particularly interested in the Pine Street Canal. I'm sure you've seen this image before. In the uh, mid 1800s, the, the lumber industry here, uh, there's this slipway in here where they brought the barges into. This building is where 453 Pine Street is now, the open area uh, with the gates and the fence. The turning basin, and that's uh, sitting on top of this orange material up here. And I don't think I wrote it on the slides, but yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot. Of, I have to check. I know there's some of the people who did the investigation watching this, so I don't get it wrong. But then there's silts and clays. There is some sawdust in there. Um, but it wasn't documented, okay? We don't have a um, really good handle on, on what's in there. Whatever they could uh, uh, found, mainly soils though, not just uh, not all sawdust, um, so that they could uh, have this lumping out and build on it. The processing factories at yeah, the mill. Okay, I just remember what slides I've got. Oh, here's another one. So these are these are published in black and white online, and uh, I used a little program to color them for the sake of this presentation to see if we can kind of relate to them a little better. It's not perfect coloring. Um, here it is up at uh, College Street, is it? Um, where they haven't quite filled in this river, this river, um, ravine, this river channel. And then Pearl was, Street. Pardon? And then it's Pearl Street. Pearl Street, okay. Yeah. And then down in the distance there, you can see the, the lumber yards by the, by the lake. So this ravine, before anything was built here, it was a river channel, and it was discharging a sandy delta into that lagoon at the, at the bottom there. Was that ravine the mouth of the Winooski, or was that no, still further? No, a much smaller channel. Yeah, no, Winooski's way to the, uh, way, way to the north. Yeah. Have it. Well, the, the source is in Cabot, and then the oh, sure. north of Berlin. Yeah, goes through, goes through the plains from the Yeah. 
Now you're tempting me to talk about the lake that filled that valley, Lake Winooski. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> another glacial lake. So, Graham, you're saying that the um, barrier bar closed off the lagoon and the wetlands before they built the railroad. Um, we know from our boreholes and the geology that when you drill down, you'll see in a moment, middle of uh, Pine Street, you've got the peat underneath it from the lagoon. Underneath where the railway road is, there's sand. And it just fits very nicely with what we see elsewhere in terms of this, this, this spit, this sandy bar coming down from the railroad road built on top. When the ravine was filled, where did the water go? Groundwater? Groundwater, yeah. It's probably still there on the ground. Thank you. Isn't this still, uh, you know, unless they filled it with clay, I, I'm not familiar. Probably it's permeable still. We just takes the groundwater, it runs underground in the same direction. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's a map for me, 1936 now. And here's the thing that uh, caused a lot of problems, Burlington Light and Power Company. This is the uh, coal gas manufacturing plant. Um, back in that time, they were starting to use uh, town gas, as I would call it. Um, we use natural gas today, methane, um, which they put directly out of the ground, generally find it above. Sometimes it's by itself, it's migrated deep down in the ground. Sometimes it's associated with oil deposits. Um, back in that time, they used coal, they were mining the coal. And there's a process of heating the coal without oxygen that releases that gas. And that's what they used to burn when you think of the old uh, uh, movies, gas on gas. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, so that's what they were burning there. A byproduct is coal tar, this thick, gooey uh, material that they had some uses for, but they had a lot of waste. And it looks like what they did, they basically just dumped it out the back. So it went into the, into the wetlands here, this is 36, into the canal, into the slip area that was still there at the time. And over time, the soft, gooey ooze sediments, natural sediments um, laid on top. And that coal tar, which is heavy, it's actually heavier than water. Sometimes, I'm not going to get into the regulatory stuff here, but <laughs> it's, uh, it, we sometimes call it uh, non aqueous phase liquid. Just means it doesn't mix with water. And it's dense non aqueous phase liquid, D apple. I remember when someone first used that phrase to me, oh, what are these apples they're talking about? <laughs> D N A P L, D apple, dense non aqueous phase liquid. That's the cold tar. It's denser than water. It made its way down through that fill and uh, basically was soaked up by that peat from the lagoon. It's not all the way through it. I'm going to show you an image where it is. And I hope everyone, not too exhausted, I know I'm taking a long time, we're nearly there. <laughs> um, so that's where, that's where we are now. I think I've got an image uh, next, here we go. I'm sure you're interested in with the canal, most people have seen this one before. Again, to kind of make it more accessible, I tried to colorize it a little bit. And here we have the manufactured gas uh plant down here actually i'm wondering surely the 19th oh yes <laughs> i'm not going to bother trying to change it now <laughs> i'm sure i'll mess it up if i try and change it now 1950 well spotted thank you it's nice to know i'm holding your attention <laughs> I I wait. Put that in <laughs> yes sick of silly <laughs> Okay, so now it's starting to look much more like it does today, but some of those old problematic industries are still there. Um, uh, Multex buildings there. Um, I believe at one point this was kind of a brush manufacturing, bristles. 
And then you've got the uh, manufacturing gas plant. Uh, I was there until 1966. I know, I remember that day, because that's the year I was born. Okay. Um, and then we've got the uh, canal over here. Big pool of goodness knows what here. Um, that's where the coal tar seeped into the ground. Okay, now for a fun bit. Um, MacDonald Morrissey, who've been putting together a uh, cross sections of the geology on behalf of Stone Environmental, uh, Mike Mobile came up with this little animation. Um, so I might play this a couple of times. So you're going you're to see how they put together all of that borehole information, put the layers together under the site. And uh, let's hope my Wi-Fi is up to it. I think I showed it a couple of times. Just <coughs> There's all the bottles, put this together. There's the bedrock down below. Stop it there a moment. I'm actually going to play this again. I think it's a cool, cool animation. If you look at this, so here's four different cross sections at different places. This one's just south of 453. We can see all the different layers. The green layer, well, first of all, bedrock, right at the bottom, the black. They haven't differentiated between the Lake Vermont, silts and clays, and the marine silts and clays from um, the Champlain Sea. Little difference in character. Generally, silts and clays are pretty low permeability. But on top of that, we've got the old beach deposits here, um, east of Pine Street. We've got the, the green organic piece. And can you see a little bowl in there? That's that lagoon that appears when you start to punch holes through it and put the four holes together. The whole story comes together. And you were asking about the barrier bar and the railway, the railroad built on top. So we do have this natural um, sand out there as well. So we see this change in geology across the sites. Beach, um, sort of organic, barrier bar. On top of the peat, there's some, um, some more kind of salts and clays that were washed in as well into that lagoon. And then the orange is that, uh, is human made fill but they built the, the lumber industry on, on top of. So, and it comes together in, in each of the sections. I'm gonna let this play to the end and... There we go. That's that's what lies beneath your feet. And I've got a couple more slides. I think there's Where's the tar. Pardon? Where's the tar? I've got a slide to show that. Should I show this one more time? Sure. Cool. Okay. One more time, and then we'll get to the uh tar. Bedrock, Glacial Lake, Lake Champlain, sorry, Champlain Sea, Lake Champlain, Lagoon, Human Made Fill.
that's what um, that's what geologists see. They, <laughs> geologists, one of our skills is kind of visual spatial. Try and imagine in 3D everything looks like just from putting the one dimensional holes in the ground and with the lightest software. Okay. So you were asking about the tar. Well, first of all, let me just explain what we're looking at here. This was done a, a few years ago um, when they were originally looking at. Uh, um, building on 453 Pine Street here. So got, this is looking towards the east of 453 Pine Street. We've got 501 Pine Street to your right. Um, the front of this cross section, sort of coming out the screen, I'd be I'd be stood at kind of where the canal is here, and then heading east, we have this slip um, where they brought the barges in with the with the lumber. Um, we got the silts and clays, marine and glacial lake deposits underneath. Uh, I try to use similar color schemes. We've got the green for those organic material peats that were in the lagoon. Um, we do have areas with wood chips um, that you mentioned over here. So you can imagine as they started to fill, maybe that they'd already filled the shoreline further north and they were just dumping their wood chips over the top. And then they decided we need more land. So then they filled the rest with soil and a new lumber yard and a new mill opened. And then um, in the early 1900s, kind of 1908, the uh, coal gas manufacturing plant opened here and they were just uh, discarding their waste, coal tar that made its way down through the through the um, fill, and most of it came to a stop in the peat. The man is like a sponge, just uh, salted up. And so there does seem to be some spots where it made it a little bit deeper. Um, but you see here in the in the slip, peat below that slip area, there's a, there's a um, lobe of uh, coal tar coming out there, and then there's a lobe to the um, western side of 501, not the street side, but the, uh, the western side of 501. Uh, in, in that area there, and uh, I'll just mention this while uh, I'm going along. When I was growing up in my grandparents' bathroom, you know what I'm gonna say, <laughs> they used uh, cold tar soap or carbolic soap. It's actually what Lister used in, uh, when he was first uh, disinfecting uh, um, operating theaters, carbolic soap. Uh, and with all the bugs, it um, works as a disinfectant that way, but uh, it's also toxic to us. So it's not what we use as disinfectants these days, but one of the products that they did use the cold tar for, cold tar soap. <clears throat> this it says established 1860, about when they first started manufacturing coal gas, but it actually says with coal gas fragrance. But <laughs> probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so they are actually trying to reproduce that old time aroma. Where did you get that? Online. <laughs> I looked for uh, coal tar soap. I noticed it does say it's coal tar fragrance. Anyone else there? Anyone else outside? Sorry, everyone watching at home. <laughs> Illegal now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think that it's fairly recently that, that in some of bees used to have a, a product that was great for um, poison ivy, um, but they don't make it anymore. I see it had coal tar. Yeah. So, so what depths are we looking at the peat, say from south to north, uh, across those four gen? I've got a section at the end that'll remind me. I think it's uh, it, it, it varies. Just remember, you've got a shoreline here, and it kind of gets deeper into the middle. Um, the fill on top, uh, they only filled what was necessary. You know, it's already kind of a wetland. It's almost land surface where they put 10, 12 feet fill on top, so it's below there. The peat, again, it goes from zero 
maximum at I don't remember exactly and the, that kind of scale. That kind of order of scale. So the question was what killed the demand for the coal oh. gas? Was it electricity or kerosene? What what put them out of business? Uh, well, that's a question for anyone who's better at history than I. I can take a guess, but it's probably as good as yours. Uh, electricity, and then eventually in the sixties we started using natural gas mm. directly from the, the deposits. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. But I, I, anyone know when they? Well, the, the plant closed in sixty six. So they were using it that late. I, was, I, I yeah. don't know. I was surprised. Yeah. The same company that was manufacturing the gas was also generating electricity. So we both ends. Yeah. Yeah. I was recently at a, a health and safety training, and uh, I can't remember how it came up now, but you know, there, there's this kind of um, image of people, it's kind of a sad one, I'm not sure I should end up with it. Coal gas was pointless. How people would do themselves away, put their head in the oven. Methane came along, that's not poisonous. You can die of asphyxiation if there's no air, but it's not poisonous. Yeah, all gas. People stop killing themselves by putting their head in the oven. <laughs> so, let's uh, uh, move on. Hydrogeology. And I'm, I, it's the history, the geological history that I'm really factoring about. The hydrogeology is my job. Um, but and he did ask me a little bit about the hydrogeology. So I've blown up that section. And uh, so here again, you can see the map. I've blown it up so it's a little bit blurred. Barge canal in here. And now I've kind of made it the same length as the section under here. So you can see the, the little dip here um, where the barge canal is. You can see this slope behind these houses. Um, what, does anyone know what this building is? Dealer.com. Okay, right. Behind that, you look up behind that building, you can see the slope, the original shoreline. And, and here's that here with the, with the beach. And then you get the uh, lagoon deposits starting in here across the uh, Superfund site, the peat, uh, this sort of these silts and clays, which were deposited on top of the peat. And then that all that orange, um, that bit that, uh, and then so Pine Street sat on on top of that, and then on top of the sands um, to the to the east of the site. And I've just I haven't I haven't looked in all the borehole logs for the actual depth of the water table, but just to give an impression, we have that if you dig down, drill down in here, you will get to groundwater. And everything below that is saturated in groundwater. If you, if you drill down and you don't get groundwater flowing into your hole, it's not because it's not there. It's just because it's happening so slowly. It's, it's low permeability. You dig down and you hit a sandy layer, it'll flow in quickly. It'll flow in and it'll come up to the level of the water table um, in there. So what happens is, this is mainly silts and clays, these old um, Champlain Sea, the old Vermont Lake deposits. They're not particularly permeable. There will be some water flowing through there, but most of the flow is uh, coming through those sands. So we have the rain falling on the land, falling in these backyards over here, infiltrating down through the soil into the sand. Uh, in some places, we've got the roof of the building there, it's running off, <laughs> that's got to go somewhere, so I'm not sure if that's going into the ground or if it's going into the drains, directly into Lake Champlain. Um, that's running off in some parts, we've got, probably got more runoff up here, because it's directly on top of those silts and clays. Here, it's on top, of, the yards are on uh, sands, there's probably more water going down to the water table through there, and then flowing under the site. Generally, that uh, water table is just in the bottom of that fill. 
that kind of makes sense if you think about it. You know, it was there was the lagoon, the wetlands there. They weren't able to put their lumber on that, so they built it up above what was the original water level in that lagoon, in that wetland, so they could build on it. So now the water level is still the same, probably not too far different to what it was in the lagoon, but now instead of being open water at wetland, it's in the bottom of the fill. Okay, so, so that's where it is now. And as I said, we have, we have uh, water infiltrating the ground, flowing through the sand, throwing it flowing through the various deposits, some of it just at the base of the fill. Peat is an unusual material that it's very porous, it's got a lot of space, but water finds it a little bit more difficult to travel through than it would a uh, sand. Um, porous, but not as permeable. It's fibrous material. Uh, but anyway, there will be some water flow through there. Remember that, and that soaked up the uh, coal tar as well, which is down there below. Um, is, uh, is the coal tar below the groundwater flow? Uh, it is below the groundwater level. Yeah, it is within the peat, which is otherwise saturated with groundwater. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just remind myself. Good. So that's the story. I'm happy to answer uh, more questions. So hopefully this is a bit more meaningful to you now. All of those forms, all of those maps, all of our knowledge of the geological history, we're able to build that column of material beneath the site, beneath our feet, the story beneath our feet. And if you go down to the bedrock, 500 million years, big gap, as we got that movement of the continents and the erosion of the glaciers, and we get Lake Vermont and those varved silts and clays in Lake Vermont. Ice retreats, we have the uh, Champlain Sea coming in, we have people, indigenous people, first people arriving, and, um, and we have wetlands in that sea. Ice continues receding. The, um, the land, what we now call Canada, bounces back, and uh, the sea goes back to its current coastline, and we get uh, Lake Champlain, and we get this original lagoon in here, and then we get the uh, built originally from the lumber industry, and then the, uh, the 1900s, the uh, um, manufactured gas plant on there. So I hope you enjoyed this story. <laughs> I'm sorry, I opened up. Thank you. Are there questions in the room? Or online? Aaron, is there any monitoring questions? Caroline, yeah. Caroline. Yes, I'm remembering people discussing building on Pine Street, where I think it's 453, because the lower part they can't build on. But lots of people thought, oh, goody, we can go. They would do designs, and then generally they would go to see what whether they could build it. And as I recall, people discussing it, they said eight feet of sawdust, and then you have bedrock. But it looks like what you've now found, I mean, this is sometimes 10 years ago, what you found is it's not sawdust, and bedrock is really more like 140 feet. Is that right? Of different those different types of soils, silt, so clay. There is a peat layer in there, right? The organic peat. There is spots of uh, where they found sawdust before most of it was filled, but generally uh, 453 and 501, uh, you, there's not big thicknesses of sawdust. There? There's what? There isn't big thicknesses of sawdust. But, uh, right, but there's soil or whatever it is until that. 90 feet, 120 feet or something. Correct, yeah, yeah. And so to build, they really have to put, put something all the way down the bedrock? Yeah, that's, um, so I don't. Is there not a lot of said They're looking at that now. Uh, right. Ways of building in that area. I don't really want to <laughs> get into that. So, you know, the whole developers are looking at that, the consultants are looking at that. 
Yes, I, I know that, but I'm just yeah. just yeah. asking. Thank you. Sure. Uh, reference to Lake Huron Plain being the sixth largest lake in the country <laughs> compared to the five Great Lakes, it built, the, the, the glaciers in, in that area built faster. That's why there's more water there. That's a great question. I always wondering why I, that was I, so I, I'm wondering if I could. It was dumping for it. I, I'm wondering if I can easily pull it. I won't pull up the slide. But you remember that slide as the, the ice sheet was receding. Mm -hmm. You had um, Lake Vermont. And then I showed it, said it only showed the modern lakes. And I said, uh, geologists call this bigger lake, Lake Urquai. Well, that's the, uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? <laughs> Tell me if I'm not. And, 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 and uh, as, the, as the ice sheet continued back, it got to around Plattsburgh and the north of um, the Adirondacks. Lake Iroquois was at a higher level, and there are rocks up there that are scoured. What actually happened, that dam between Lake Champlain and Lake, Lake Iroquois, and it melted away, Lake Iroquois was higher, and there was a huge flood. There's evidence that the rocks around there were scoured as the level of Lake Iroquois came down. Was it discharged into uh, Lake Vermont? Yeah. <laughs> I just had a small question. When you were explaining the the uh, silt clay accumulation uh, during the glacial period, yeah, uh, the difference between winter and summer, yeah, uh, um, and I forget which was better, summer or the coarser material. In the, the winter, the finer the finer material would that have been accumulating actually all during the year, and it was just the addition of the coarser material. Good question, man. Now you're kind of getting into details. I think what what happens if the water is moving around during the summer? There's more water in the lakes, moving a bit. There's probably thermal currents in there. The really fine clays may be kept in suspension, mm -hmm. and it just needs that very quiet conditions. Beneath the frozen lake for, for that very fine material to, to settle out. Graham, I'm I'm still interested in the fill. Yeah. And um uh because you you've changed my ideas about what the fill uh, consisted of, but I'm curious to know why they would have brought in so much soil that was silty and clay. In particular, was that just because that's the soil that was available? And can they, uh, just a follow up question to that, if someone were interested, could they identify where that soil came from? That was. So you're testing my knowledge of abilities here. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm, I, I've got a lot of background and I'll just use that to try and answer the question, but I, I don't know the specifics. I haven't asked, asked those specific questions. In terms of using uh, salt that we now, soil that we now describe as silt and clay, uh, silty, or I think they might be sandy material. I haven't got the words for you. Um, it's a mixture of stuff. Uh, what's available, but they also needed something that they could build on that wasn't just going to sink. So they, they couldn't have had 10, 15 feet of sawdust. I don't know where they got it from. And we identify where they got it from. We've got a great comment in the chat. Here we go. Basement excavation. I was scrolling to my. Yeah. Ah, okay. The right person to answer. Why don't you read it for people that are. What does it say? So this is Dan Boyden. Hi, Dan. Uh, he's uh, the lead consultant with Stone Environmental. And he's saying the fill likely came from basement excavations as basement residences were booming. Burlington. Burlington. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was one place. Hmm. Thanks, Dad. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> ask a friend. <laughs> Call a friend. <laughs> Answer that question. Oh, when you were talking about how a um, lagoon can be formed, um, I was thinking about the actual conditions in Lake Champlain. I, I, to correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is a south to north flow 
of water in the lake along the, our shore of Burlington. Is that, okay. I, I haven't been here long enough to. Okay. I, I, so I you, you know that? Yeah. 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 So so that spit probably formed from the south to the north. Um, yeah. is, is what I'm guessing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That could have been a mixture because the water flows both ways. Right, but ultimately, it goes into the Virginia River that goes north. So it's normal, yeah, north. the river flows. That's right. So, uh, oh, so it's, it's not necessarily the, you know, if the, the river is discharging, the way the, 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 the lake is discharging, it's not necessarily the way the Sanskrit would go. It's more the dominant wind direction that creates the waves. Uh, the, oh, waves put, north. the waves put the sand up. Yeah, it goes up at an angle mm -hmm. with the wind direction, mm -hmm. and then the, the wash flows back down due to gravity straight down. So it gradually moves forward with the with the winds. <laughs> what yeah. about at the north end of North Beach? There's a lagoon there, I think. I mean that there's a wetland area there, yeah. with some open water. Um, but right. that's Rock Point, just south of Rock Point. So that was a, a place where you know the wind kind of gets stopped by Rock Point. Should have invited one of my colleagues from the uh, DEC who works on Lake Champlain to answer those questions. Yeah. If people did have follow-up questions, how could they ask them? Um, my uh, so I, I, I'm doing this as a geologist, I don't necessarily have my state hat on, but I did put my email on there and we can arrange some things. So okay, yeah, so it's okay to send your email on the next week. Yeah, questions. Yeah. 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 I think we'll send out everybody who registered that, that information. Just keep in mind that it's, uh, we're incredibly busy. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I've got the emails at the moment. I'm trying to get through them. <laughs> I'm well, going to set down. It's seven, it's seven <laughs> now. There, there aren't any other online comments or questions that you have? I, I just got one more question about the Barge Canal area. Is that open to the public to visit? Well, that's a that's a, a somewhat of a complex question, Andy, and I'm glad you asked it because the, the Barton Canal is private and public plane, and it's not formally open to the public to visit, but there are no fences that keep people out. So people have been visiting the Barge Canal for decades. Uh, uh, and so it is sort of a quasi-public accessible area. It's not officially public. But um, for people that wanted to come down and visit um, with people who have spent uh, a lot of time there, uh, Friends of the Barge Canal is offering mini tours on the first Saturday of every month, starting on June 3rd at 9 o'clock in the morning. So anybody that wants to come down on, uh, at 9 o'clock on June 3rd and then subsequently every Saturday throughout the summer and into the fall, um, that would be a great way to come down and, and visit. And, and if somebody couldn't come on a Saturday morning, uh, they could certainly contact Friends of the Barge Canal, um, and we could arrange a, a small group to look, walk down there. Because I know that if you don't know the area, it can seem a little bit confusing or intimidating. But to walk, once you walk down through with somebody who has regularly walked there, um, it's, it's much easier to conceive of. And you have the map, so you have kind of a conceptual idea, but it's, it's good to have a, a guide. So if people want more information about um, Friends of the Barge Canal or about the Barge Canal and access to it, um, our website is pinestreetbargecanal.org. And, um, and uh, Carolyn is holding up the map with um, our information on it. And, um, and uh, our uh, email is sosburlington at gmail.com. So, very roughly, how much private and public uh, areas? There are 28 acres um, uh, total with the water. There are 11 of those acres are owned by the city. The rest of it is private land. But 
the, there's a transition happening where um, uh, that private land, except for the four acres that Graham is referring to, 452 Pine Street, where there's a plan to build a bathhouse, um, is going to be donated to the city. So <laughs> and conserved. That will be conserved land. And how much is that? How big is 24 that? Well, 24 acres. But how much is she donating? She's donating approximately four acres. But then along with that figure that she's buying, she's buying the, I'm speaking of Joe Neal King, right? So Bathhouse, she's buying from Rep Davis the, all the land that's on the other side of the canal, except one, I'm pointing in the wrong direction, but one uh, piece, one prop, uh, parcel that is owned by uh, um, Scully. Russ Scully. Russ oh, Scully. Right, right, right. Um, and Hula. Uh, and he bought that when he bought the, bought the property. So that also is going to be donated to the city. So Russ is donating his. Yeah. Okay. And she is. But how much land does she donate? Well, about. About, um, about uh, five, ten. No, more like twelve. Oh, okay. So almost, it's really equal to what we have now. Yeah, with the city. Yeah. and then that's going to hopefully be all conserved. Yeah, that's the that's the plan, and that's part of the work of the friends. And then it'll be um, some sort of a perk or not, just always conserved. Um, well, that's under discussion. Okay, possible. Yes, it'll probably be under the under the aegis of Parks and Rec. I'm saying we'll be able to have access. So. Well, that's a discussion that we need to have. Still have, okay. So there is public access. We have permission from the private landowners to cross that, that land to get to the public land, and we've done a considerable amount of cleaning on that land. So there's nobody saying no, don't go there. Except I think we have a gate, don't we, or something? You can walk around it. Oh, you just can't drive around it. Oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Graham. Thank you for inviting me.